So yeah, I'm Ellie. I am a doctoral researcher at the University of Chester, and my PhD research is looking into how bioarchaeological studies, particularly those to do with ideas around racialized characteristics and British identity, how they're communicated in the mainstream online news media. Um, and I'm going to be thinking about how might this influence our wider understanding of modern British identity and white supremacy. And to me, these studies have been growing in prominence because people are trying to achieve anti-racism. And by highlighting people of color in the past, they can dispel racist narratives around a white Britain or white exceptionalism. But is it successful? Are we empowering or are we oppressing? Who has evaluated this impact in order for it to be such a prominent feature of modern ancient biomolecular research? And this is a mix of public archaeology, bioarchaeology, media studies, and a critical evaluation of the field building on my doctoral research, as I've said. And just before I kind of really get into it, I wanted to address uh, that my positionality is important, and I'm talking about anti-racism as a white person. Um, I'm doing that to draw on calls from leading black and global majority anti-racist researchers in the field um, who have asked for support with this, and that is because archaeology is overwhelmingly white. Um, and I truly believe that more white people need to join these conversations, but only after appropriately interrogating their own experiences and understanding of their whiteness. And we simply cannot leave this to the tiny minority of non-white archaeologists to tackle alone. If we do that, it would continue to perpetuate really harmful ideas and expect people to operate within very toxic spaces rather than potentially pursuing their real interests, which may not be race related. But by becoming an anti-racist discipline, um, sorry, becoming an anti-racist discipline is fundamental to the future of archaeology, in my opinion. So, so I'm going to start with a question for the room, and I'm going to steal it from an anti-racist educator, Jeffrey Boache, and ask, what is at stake? Because I think that's something that we maybe haven't considered appropriately. And the point is to clarify your thinking, to develop your actions. It's a place to build a methodology from. What are the consequences of your activism, your learning, or your research? Who do they affect? What is at stake? And I'd like you to think about this as I speak, and I will come back to it later, but it's something that I think is going to be really fundamental in anti-racism in archaeology moving forward. So how do archaeologists do anti-racism? Well, I think it's clear that there's been a rise in recent years. Um, there will be a series of quotes to accompany me on my slides, so quickly read it, but if anyone's familiar with this article published earlier this month, please don't think I condone it or agree with the vast majority of the sentiments expressed. It was a fairly anti-left-wing, anti-woke kind of think piece about not being able to say your true thoughts about archaeology, and I don't think that that's realistic, I don't think it's fair. But I do kind of think that what they've said here might be true. Um, this fictional person would probably be able to find a supervisor, but without engaging with contemporary theory, they just would do poorly. And activism is a part of contemporary theory, whether that's class, feminism, queer interpretations, or anti-racism. So alongside anti-racist initiatives in archaeology, you have decolonization. They're not the same, um, and I would say that decolonization makes up a part of anti-racism, but to be anti-racist, you don't necessarily have to be decolonizing. We often see them used interchangeably or in tandem with one another, whether that's an updated reading list, a methodology change, or theoretical interpretive developments, people really want to be seen to be decolonizing. And here you can see that the trend has increased in the past few years compared to the kind of 10 year um, progress from about 2017 onwards, we've seen nearly a doubling in the amount of archeological studies that refer to decolonization. And it really peaks in 2021. I don't know how that data is going to continue to move forwards, um, but that is a result of the 2020 Black Lives Matter protests. And if you look similarly at anti-racism in archeology, span the numbers are much lower before we were talking about the thousands and now we're in the hundreds, but there's the same trend can be seen. And it's a response to these Black Lives Matter protests, to the trends in archeological theory and to what institutions kind of expect of people and what people now expect of their institutions. So you can see here that people's language really prefers decolonization and their approaches want to respond to decolonization potentially more than anti-racism. Um, but realistically, they're addressing similar issues. And when we talk about decolonization, as I said, you are talking about anti-racism. And these are really simple keyword searches, but it gives an idea of the prominence of these topics in archaeological conversations. 
Archaeology is addressing its issues with race really slowly, and anti-racist activism is focused on fighting the discipline's historic wrongs. So now we can think about the harm that archaeology has caused specifically with reference to race, and bioarchaeology, I think, has a major part to play in that. So this quote came during the 2020 Black Lives Matter protest, which saw many heritage institutions across the UK publicly state commitments to doing better in anti-racist practice. And I don't want to kind of pick on anyone, but I think that this is one example of a larger problem, and that's seeing the sins of archaeology as a thing of the past. Modern archaeology is exclusive, and it's commonly called out as not being a safe space for people of colour to work. Alongside changing these toxic environments, we need to consider how our research maintains these racist structures. Bioarchaeology in 2022 has these really lofty anti-racist aims of establishing diversity in the past. However, this is achieved through the study of racialized characteristics and fundamental biological determinism. It just is race science. Accepting that is the first step to acknowledging the harm that's being caused, even by so-called anti-racist work. Now, race science is generally perceived to be a bad thing, so how does this lend itself to activism? Well, we're exploring the real meaning of our work, taking this science and assuming that it will have a positive outcome, while dismissing our own history as a discipline, where race science has and continues to cause social harm, increased inequalities, and violence. This assumption is being repeated on a huge scale, and little considerations for its effectiveness in changing public opinion have been made. So I argue that there has been a serious lack of activist theory applied to these studies, as well as no real methodology for dissemination. An evaluation of the public impact is needed urgently to understand how this work is received and establish where its successes and weaknesses lie. Okay. So how can we explore the results of race science in the general public? Is the activism that I hope drives these studies seeing its intended results, which I don't believe it is? I think the one key way to explore this is the media. Sorry, I've lost my mouse. Um, the mouse is just not on the screen anymore. Oh, there we go. Um, so I think that the key way to explore this is the media, specifically online news sites. Active forms of public engagement like documentaries, podcasts, and YouTube videos made by academics reach a specific audience with an established interest. The online news is passive for many, and they will discover information without realizing it. It is a huge source of archaeological knowledge for a lot of people that goes largely unrecognized. And I will say it's important to think of online news as both specific journalistic outlets and social media. As you can see here, a large percentage of people use the online news as a source of information, and social media is only growing in its contribution to this. Last year, TikTok spent most of the year as the most visited website over Google. And that's especially important as young people are looking to places like TikTok as a source of their news and information. And I appreciate that the media is a contentious topic. We've seen criticism of the media's racist abuse from activists for decades. And here is a quote from Malcolm X referring to the media's ability to twist narratives, constructing heroes and villains. In archaeology, I think most discussions about the media have really tended to center around the notion of the expert, the archaeologist, and the idea of framing the innocent as guilty is echoed. But where is the innocence for the subjects of our study? And why do researchers accept no guilt for the harmful narratives that come from our work? I believe that the failings in anti-racist practice as it's disseminated through the media come from two bookends in the research process. The promotion of race science, as I have mentioned, and that is now a fundamental aspect of our discipline. And beyond that, a failure in media literacy and communication. Studies are rarely communicated effectively for the purposes of writing an anti-racist narrative, as I will not go into. So using the media as a tool for evaluating the impact of activism, again, might seem problematic. You could say that outlets have political agendas, they'll frame stories in a certain way and sensationalize. Looking at this recent headline from within the last week, this is from The Guardian, clickbait might come to mind. We're often critical of the messaging that the media convey, especially in cases like these. Headlines are written to entice a reader in, generating more ad revenue for the outlet and are designed to be unmissable, something that you really have to engage with. In archaeology, this requires something shocking, titillating, or revolutionary. And we see a lot of sensationalism. But who does the blame really lie with here? My research shows that articles rely closely on the press release that they're given. Journalists aren't really going into sort of archaeological expertise. They'll just read what they're told and then change a couple of words and publish it. 
They also quote the archaeologists themselves, and that's where a lot of misinformation comes from. So uh, we will talk about revolutioning our understanding or changing ideas of being human. Um, so as you can see here, the researchers themselves have stated that the most, this is the most significant burial ever discovered in Britain. And now the grey boxes come from the press release and the white is just from the article itself. Um, so the researchers are excited, but they're sensationalising their study. And this is just the most recent example that kind of came up about this. But it does happen a lot. And I don't want, again, to single anyone out. But we take this excitement and this love for our discipline. And when we put it in the media, it can tell stories that we might not necessarily be accurately reflecting we're looking at. So we've romanticized the story with glints of gold and the most ornate. Nothing is ever just a good find. And that starts way before the press hear about a study. And I see these quotes are innocent. They show a passion and excitement, and I don't want people to feel like they can't enjoy their work. But when we're thinking about communicating with the public more broadly, we really need to manage their expectations as well as our own and think about how that can, exaggeration changes the public's understanding of archaeology. When this comes to racialized studies and anti-racism, the sensationalism becomes much more dangerous. People need to understand the reality of results, particularly when it comes to science that cannot give a definite answer. If the public are told that something is a revolutionary fact, they'll believe it. So when the science is fairly criticised as not being 100% reliable, because what is? A narrative becomes a lie, experts lose credibility, and the culture war starts all over again. So yeah, Cheddar Man is going to come up. It's inevitable in these sorts of conversations. Um, as anti-racist archaeologists, we tell stories of migration, people with dark skin, people in diverse communities living in harmony. And then we stop. And we think that our storytelling establishes the existence of people in the past who we now see as racialized, and we hope that's enough to stop racism. I know that some of you will be thinking, well, if we don't prove that, then the racists win. But they're kind of winning anyway. Our current approach is not suitable, and the media reaction is a symptom of that root cause, that anti-racism in bioarchaeology is rooted in problematic ideas of race and oversimplistic methods of activism. We want the outcome on the left. We want people to say that they now feel more secure in their British identity as a person of colour. But more often than not, we see the one on the right. We see criticisms, we see challenges, we see people trying to find holes in what we're saying, because there are holes most of the time. Some people do feel validated by research, but this validation has been forgotten. For Cheddar Man especially, the legacy of this research is one of racism and hatred. So notice this tweet, this is a tweet on the left. I have anonymized it, so it doesn't look exactly like a tweet anymore. Um, but it comes from an account who was set up within the past few months and they exclusively tweet about Cheddar Man being white. It's very strange. Um, and this is, oh God, I've lost the mask, there you go. This is five years after the study came out. This is part of a Twitter conversation sparked by someone sharing a Guardian article about the recent Meghan Markle, Harry, Prince Harry documentary about Meghan Markle's experience of racism in the media. And Cheddar Man and Meghan Markle are often linked due to the time of the publication and the desires of an overtly racist British press. Cheddar Man hasn't helped this conversation, but the uncertainty of ADNA has proven to be a tool for racists to abuse. Now, I might have missed something, but I don't think archaeologists have really looked into the relationship between Cheddar Man and Meghan Markle. In February 2018, the UK was in the throes of Brexit and waiting for a royal wedding, and the media coverage of the time fixated on those two things. We've considered how Brexit in the news shapes the reception of the story. We have the Brexit hypothesis. But the simultaneous coverage of a racialized woman entering into an institution that, many, that to many represents British heritage and identity more than anything else has just been overlooked. Meghan Markle is still being compared to Cheddar Man, as these tweets show. I think that the Cheddar Man story would have had far less impact if it weren't for the media frenzy over a racialized woman entering the British royal family. We haven't seen any archaeological research hit the same levels of zeitgeist or reception as Cheddar Man, but similar studies are still being published. The cultural moment is as important as anything else, and alongside revising our processes of our research, we need to be conscientious of the media environment that we are publishing our stories into. If the press are in the midst of a racialized onslaught, archaeological race science will help no one. And that's something that should have been considered at the time of the study. Now, this is an old saying, but I think it's still relevant. I think that bioarchaeologists have good intentions. There's sessions like this with a fairly decently filled room where people really care about activism. And I know that people care about anti-racism. But there's not been enough critical evaluation of the, to me, blindingly obvious fact. 
that we are continuing to cause more harm than good. Now, I'm not trying to, dis trying to say to disengage from the news media. It's a vital and underappreciated form of public archaeology. We need to change archaeology, its anti-racist approaches, and its ideas around race science, or this will never be a discipline that can achieve anti-racism. And I think once we've done that, then we can move into working on our relationships with the media, because both are fundamentally flawed. So, yes, I am going to quote a dinosaur film at an archaeology conference, but I don't know if it ever really loses its relevance. We've decided that archaeology can help with modern racist discussions by establishing the presence of people of colour in the past. That is the hypothesis. That's what a lot of people are working off. But why? Who decided that? Who has evaluated it? As far as I can tell, it's no one. It's what we're doing over and over. But should we? There's another element here that I haven't really had the time to address. And that, as I say, it's just that archaeologists just love what we do. And we really love learning about the past. And we think that growing this knowledge is an inherently good thing. Understand the past or be doomed to repeat it. But we can get really lost in this love of learning and forget the ethical considerations that we have to make when we're conducting this research. So what was at stake? I've come back to it. Um, as academics in toxic spaces, you're expected to publish or perish, get a high ref score, and now save the world. Even if you disengage from activism completely, if in your head, your work is completely independent of any political topics, what is at stake? How can your research be used and who does that impact? I can only lend my voice to this discussion. I can't solve it on my own. This is going to take a fundamental change of bioarchaeology as a discipline. But I think an important first step is to encourage everyone to think about this question when you design your next research project or do some anti-racist teaching. The stakes of my research are fairly high. I could be starting an alt-right pylon on myself with publication. I could publish and lots of people hate me for saying that something has gone wrong. I might never get a job. More worryingly, someone might take my research and use it to hurt the very people that I'm trying to help. I can definitely see a Daily Mail study or article about woke academics that get twisted into people of colour taking over academic arguments. And people could get hurt. Maybe I'll make someone think twice about the research they're conducting, how it's approached and framed, and the narratives that come out of it. I hope that the stakes include building a better archaeology collaboratively with the people in this room who clearly have an interest in activism and in doing the right thing. The stakes, if we don't achieve that, are to continue to cause harm in the name of good. And to me, it's just not acceptable. <laughs>